The Peter Schiff Show. Today's podcast is sponsored by Ladder. Ladder makes it fast and easy to get affordable term life insurance without leaving home. Just go to ladderlife.com slash gold today to see if you're instantly qualified. Today's podcast is also sponsored by Avast. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online through a large range of features. You can learn more about Avast One at avast.com. It was definitely a risk-on day on Friday. In fact, everything was up except gold and U.S. Treasuries. Now, of course, I don't look at U.S. Treasuries as being risk-off. I mean, personally, I think one of the riskiest things you could do with your money is buy U.S. Treasuries. But that perception is not generally shared yet in the investment community, although I think more and more people are being clued into the risky nature of U.S. Treasuries. And I think that is one of the reasons that the bond market is falling and will likely to continue to fall. And so I think it's going to lose its status as being a risk-off trade. And I think the most important risk-off asset that will be left standing will end up being gold. Bitcoin, of course, as the riskiest of the risk assets, was very strong on Friday as well. In fact, back above 60,000 per Bitcoin, I think for the first time in maybe six months or so. I'll have more about the Bitcoin rally and what's going on later in the podcast. For now, I just want to focus on markets in general. In fact, the only index that didn't finish positive on Friday was the Russell 2000, which ended up slipping about a third of a percent. The Dow's gain was the strongest, up 382 points, which is just over 1%. But the strongest stocks in the market continue to be the oil stocks. In fact, the oil stocks are among the only stocks that are making new 52-week highs. In fact, they consistently hit new highs throughout the week. Now, the markets in general were all positive on the week, but the strength was particularly pronounced announced in oil stocks. And if you recall on this podcast, I've been pounding the table on oil stocks and how cheap they were. They're not as cheap anymore, but I still think there's a lot of value in the sector, especially if you look at the move in oil. Oil finished the week pretty much around the high print, $82.28, up another 97 cents a barrel on Friday. This chart looks incredible in oil. I think we've taken through the psychological resistance of $80 a barrel. So I really think the next target for the price of oil is going to be around $100 a barrel. I would not be surprised if we traded up to $100 a barrel before the end of this calendar year. And I expect 2022 to see the price rise significantly higher than $100 a barrel. We may even get back up to the high from 2008, which was somewhere around $145 per barrel. I don't think we ever technically hit $150 a barrel back in 08, but I think there's a pretty good chance that we not only hit $150 a barrel in 2022, but that we exceed that level. In fact, looking at the producer price numbers that came out on Thursday, when I did my last podcast, we went over the beat in the CPI. The PPI did not come out higher than expected. It basically matched expectations. They were looking for a gain in September of one half of 1%. And that's exactly where the number came in. The year over year increase actually ended up being a little bit less than expected. They were looking for 8.7. We got 8.6, but that is an increase of the 8.3% year over year move that we had the week before. But think about that number. 8.6% is the rise in producer prices. We have not seen a year-over-year increase in producer prices that strong since the 1970s. And the more scary part about it is we're talking about the latter 1970s, not the early 1970s. So the numbers didn't get this bad until we were nearing the end of that inflationary decade. Whereas now, we've already got numbers that are closer to the peak of what we were experiencing at the end 
of the stagflationary decade of the 1970s, but we're experiencing at the very beginning of what I think is going to be an even bigger stagflationary decade this time, meaning an even weaker economy than the one that we experienced during the 1970s, but with even higher rates of inflation than what we experienced during the 1970s. One of the problems, of course, when it comes to inflation is that the official numbers will not tell the true story, at least as accurately as it told it back then, because of the significant changes that I have talked about many times on this podcast that have been made over the years to the CPI, so that the CPI will never be able to reveal as much inflation, at least as it manifests itself in rising prices, as it was able to do in the 1970s. Now, even given that, I still expect that we will be printing official inflation numbers that actually end up being higher than the ones that were reported during the 1970s. It's just that in reality, the real rates will actually be significantly higher than what is being reported. So the numbers are certainly going to look worse than the 1970s, but it's going to feel a lot worse because even though the numbers are going to be bad, they won't be nearly bad enough to reflect the true misery that is being experienced by the population. Ladder makes it fast and easy to get affordable term life insurance. In the past, if you wanted to get life insurance, you had to drive across town, then sit through a sales pitch, fill out a ton of paperwork, and then wait six to eight weeks to find out if you've even gotten approved. Not to mention, agents trying to sell you on bundling your insurance with their other products like car insurance or fire and casualty insurance. But with Ladder, you can get life insurance without the hassle or even having to leave home. When you apply for $3 million or less in coverage, it's all taken care of digitally. There's no doctors, no needles, no paperwork. So if you're between the ages of 20 and 60 and you're looking for life insurance coverage, Ladder makes it quick and easy. But most importantly, Ladder provides term coverage. And that's really the only type of insurance most people need. You have a lot of insurance companies trying to sell people on whole life, but most people don't need insurance for the whole of their life. They only need insurance during a certain portion of their lives when they have young children who are financially dependent on them. And in those circumstances, what you want is the largest possible death benefit to take care of your loved ones when you're not there to do it, but you want one that imposes the least financial burden on you while you're still alive, and that's term life insurance. Everybody who buys term life insurance hopes they live and all their money is a waste, but in the unlikely event that you don't live, you want to make sure that your family is taken care of in the best possible way, and again, only term life insurance can provide that kind of bang for your insurance buck. So go to ladderlife.com slash gold today to see if you're instantly approved. That's ladderlife, L-A-D-D-E-R, life.com slash gold to see if you're instantly approved. In fact, we got a more realistic representation of the type of price increases that Americans are dealing with on Friday when we got the import-export prices because these prices are not nearly as manipulated. In fact, I don't know that they're manipulated at all. Because import-export prices are not what the Fed looks at when they're measuring inflation. And these prices just simply price the goods that are actually being imported and exported into the country. There's no substitution. There's no hedonics. It's just the prices are the prices. And the year-over-year increase in export prices is 16.3%. Now, as bad as that number is, it's actually a slight reduction from the 16.8% year-over-year gain in the previous year. But think about that. The price of what we're exporting is 16.3% higher than the price of the same products a year earlier. Now, maybe they're not identical products because we may not be exporting exactly today what we exported back then, but it's going to be pretty close. That is a huge increase, and this reflects the costs of domestic production. And as I've mentioned on this podcast, if we are having to charge 16.3% more for the goods that we export, wouldn't we also have to charge a similar increase 
for the goods that we don't export, at least the same goods? Because I'm sure a lot of the stuff that American companies export, they also sell those products domestically as well. It's not like we're producing solely for export. We're producing goods. Some of the goods are being exported and some of the goods are being sold domestically. And if it's costing us 16% more to produce the goods that we sell abroad, it probably stands to reason that it's costing us 16% more to produce the goods that we sell domestically. So that is what's really going on with prices in the United States. I think that 16% year-over-year increase is more reflective than that 8% increase for the PPI or the 5.7 or so year-over-year, I think, was the gain in the CPI. That's really more reflective. In fact, even if you look at import prices, import prices are not up nearly as much as export prices, but they're up 9.2% year over year. That's higher than the 9%. Actually, that was downwardly revised to 8.9 in August, but now it's up to 9.2 for September. Actually, it was below estimates. They were thinking it might be as high as 9.4, but still, these are the goods that Americans are buying. These are the imported products. The prices are up 9.2% year over year. Most of the goods that Americans are buying are in fact imported. That's why we have this huge problem with the ports. We don't have the capacity to unload all of the stuff that we're importing. Why are we importing so much stuff? because we can't produce it ourselves. And where are Americans getting the money to buy all the goods that they don't produce? Well, the Fed is creating it. But it's not only a problem of importing the goods into the United States, it's transporting them from the ports all around the country. You can read all these articles about the problems with trucking and the shortage of truck drivers. Why do we have this logistics problem in the United States? It's because everything is imported. See, back in the day when America produced stuff itself, we had factories all over the country. And so if you were in Chicago and you were going to consume something, chances are it was manufactured in a facility not too far from where you lived so that the actual transportation costs to get the goods to you were a lot lower because the production took place a lot closer to where you are. But because the entire nation has outsourced its manufacturing to Asia and all the stuff comes in on ships and it arrives at a port in Los Angeles and now you have to bring it to the Midwest or the East Coast, everything has to be long hauled on trucks. I mean, some of it goes by rail, but unfortunately we don't have that great a rail transportation system anymore in the United States. So most of the goods have to be put on a truck and sent along a highway. But the problem is there's just not enough of them. Given how far everything has to travel, the fact that we don't produce very much ourselves anymore, and also think about the distribution system that we have now and how much more transportation is involved. Because before we had the internet, the way Americans bought products was they drove to the store and they bought the products. So all the products were shipped to this one location and then people showed up and picked them up. And they generally didn't live that far away from where the store was because they went to their neighborhood store. So there really wasn't a lot of transportation. But now you have so many products that are being individually shipped directly to the end buyer. I mean, every day at my house, we get Federal Express, UPS, the post office. There are boxes that are just stacked up outside of my house. And sometimes I open up these huge boxes and there's hardly anything inside. I mean, there just might be some toilet paper that we ordered. And here it is delivered individually in one box. I mean, think about the added cost of shipping items individually to each consumer who buys them, as opposed to the consumer driving to a store and filling up their trunk of their car on one trip with all the stuff. And now you have all this stuff traveling all over the country. And most of it is emanating from outside the country it costs a fortune to distribute all of these goods that are imported 
and then purchased individually by consumers online. And all of this cost is now really starting to catch up to the U.S. economy and exposing the underlying flaws in the economy. And one of the ways that that is exposed is through shortages and increasing prices. And of course, the media, the government could just try to blame everything on supply bottlenecks or shortages, but take no responsibility for creating the economic climate through artificially low interest rates that resulted in all these supply shortages, bottlenecks in the first place. We got a big economic number, though, on Friday morning. It was retail sales, and the expectation was for a drop. Minus 0.1% is what they were looking for for September retail sales. Instead, retail sales went the other way, and they gained 0.7. In fact, if you took out vehicles, the gain was 0.8, double the 0.4 that was expected. Now, the prior month was a lot bigger. We had a 2% rise in retail sales, X vehicles, a 0.9% rise in the top line. The only number that didn't exceed estimates was X vehicles and gas, uh, which was up 0.7, exactly what was expected. But again, a slowdown from the 2.1% increase that we had in the prior month. Now, as soon as this number came out, the price of gold that was already down got clobbered again. I think gold was down about $10 an ounce going into the retail sale numbers, and then it dropped about another 20 to be down about $30 in the aftermath of those stronger than expected numbers. But we settled just below $1,770 an ounce in the price of gold. You know, briefly, I think we did manage to peak above 1800 during the week, but we couldn't hold those gains. But still, gold had a gain on the week, and gold stocks had pretty substantial gains on the week. In fact, even though gold was very weak on Friday, gold stocks, though down, were not down very much, especially considering the magnitude of the gains that they registered early in the week. I thought that they held up pretty well regarding the near $30 sell off on Friday. Now, Why did the price of gold sell off as a result of these retail sales numbers? Well, the view is that these retail sales numbers are indicative of a stronger economy, right? The consumer is out there spending, buying products. This shows the economy is strong. And so what does that mean? Well, that means the Fed is going to have to be more aggressive. We're going to have to have a tighter monetary policy in response to this stronger economic data. And that is what immediately sent all the algos into sell mode when it comes to gold. But if you think about it, these increasing retail sales numbers do not indicate economic strength. They are part of the economic problem. The problem is Americans are spending too much money. We're buying too much stuff. That's already evident in these record high trade deficits that I just spoke about. So this is not about a strong economy producing more stuff. This is just about a bubble economy where people are buying more stuff. But again, we're not even sure if retail sales are going up because consumers are buying more or because they're paying more. I mean, it's even possible they're buying less but paying a lot more because retail sales reflect the prices that are paid. They're not adjusted for inflation. So if you're simply paying more for the stuff that you're buying, that's going to have a positive impact on retail sales. But if the gain in retail sales is more of a function of inflation than genuine economic growth, why is that bearish for gold? It's not bearish for gold at all. It's bullish because if it's inflation that is driving retail sales, then inflation should also be driving gold and they should be driving in the same direction and that's up. But again, you know, this is a very nervous market. There is a lot of negative sentiment in the gold market and the gold stock market. So if we are now in a new bull market in gold, we are certainly climbing a wall of worry and traders are looking for any excuse to sell. But what that does is it gives the stronger buyers who actually understand the fundamentals the opportunity to buy more.
Avast has been a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years, and it's trusted by over 435 million users. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online through a range of features. And you can learn more about Avast One at Avast.com. Some of the many features that are provided are antivirus. They have award-winning antivirus software that stops viruses and malware from harming your devices. They also have data breach monitoring. This enables you to find out if your online accounts have been compromised and whether you need to change your passwords. Also, firewall protection. That keeps your personal information secure and prevents attacks that seek to access your computer and steal your data. And ransomware protection. This secures your personal photos, documents, and other files from being modified, deleted, or encrypted by ransomware attacks. It even speeds up your PC by optimizing the background activity of your applications and other programs. And with SmartScan, you can find and remove viruses and resolve the most common privacy and performance issues using the optimization scan. In fact, I've been using Avast for years myself which is why I was particularly happy to take them on as a new sponsor. Avast prevents over 1.5 billion attacks every month with Avast One, so you can confidently take control of your online world without worrying about viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, or other cyber crimes. And you can learn more about Avast One at Avast.com. In fact, the more important number that I think is particularly relevant to the price of gold was the consumer sentiment number that came out a little bit later in the day. This was from the University of Michigan. The prior month, the number was 72.8, which was a pretty weak number. It was a slight bounce over the even weaker number from the prior month, the consensus was for the improvement to continue and for the index to move up to 74. Instead, it went the other way and it went all the way down to 71.4. That is the second lowest reading since 2011. But if you actually dig down into the weeds and look at the buying conditions for vehicles and appliances, and this is as rated by the consumers who are thinking about buying vehicles and appliances, that reading plunged to its lowest level on record, meaning there's never been a time where consumers were less optimistic regarding their ability to buy a car or a major appliance. Now, why is that? Well, the big problem is prices. Prices are going up. Inflation expectations have now surged to 4.8%. This is the highest they've been since 2008. And what this refers to is what consumers expect for next year, 2022. Not the inflation that they're experiencing this year. They think we're still going to have 4.8% inflation next year, which, by the way, would be less. We are on track to have 6% year-over-year inflation at the end of 2021. But consumers expect that level to almost be maintained because it's only moving back down slightly below 5%. But remember, Powell is on record as having already stated that the most important indicator, as far as the Fed is concerned, of inflation is consumer expectations. Powell has already said that that is the mistake of the 1970s. He believes that that inflation, in fact, may have been transitory as well, except for those pesky consumers didn't understand it was transitory and began to expect inflation. And they built those expectations into their labor demands for higher wages. And businesses began to expect that inflation to continue. And it was all these expectations that created this cycle, this wage price spiral that got out of control. But Powell is saying that he wants to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So the Fed is very vigilant when it comes to expectations. They're watching these expectations like a hawk. And if there's any signs that they have become unanchored from 2%, because somehow Powell still claims that inflation expectations remain anchored at 2%, despite the fact that we just got a report that it's anchors away. 
I mean, we're at 4.8. We're more than double. We're Soon we're going to be triple the 2% inflation expectation. Well, where's the Fed? Why are they not doing anything when by their own benchmark that they established, we've got an inflation problem? I think the reason that Powell claimed that it was expectations that he was looking at and not the actual numbers was maybe because at the time the expectations were lower. And so he was just pulling a data point that he thought supported his stance that there's nothing to do. But now that the expectations have risen significantly, well, now what are they going to do? Now they got to find another reason to ignore the inflation problem. Of course, the reality is that we don't have inflation because consumers expect it. Consumers expect inflation because we have inflation. So once again, the Fed has the cart before the horse in claiming that the only reason we have inflation is because those dumb consumers expect it. No, the consumers, at least when it comes to this particular metric, they're not so dumb, right? The reason they expect inflation is because it's there, because they see it. And the reality is they're not smart enough to realize how much worse it's going to get. They're just probably extrapolating what they're already experiencing, and they simply assume that what they're experiencing is going to continue. But the reason that they have that experience in the first place is because of the Fed. So the Fed creates all the inflation, and it's the inflation that the Fed creates that drives expectations that it will continue. It's not the expectations themselves. It's kind of like saying it's raining because the sidewalks are wet. No, the sidewalks are wet because it rained. But this is the crazy kind of logic that you get from the Federal Reserve. And in fact, it's not really logic. I think the Federal Reserve knows that what they're saying is nonsense. They're just saying it anyway because they have to come up with an excuse, a rationalization for why they're not doing anything about an obvious inflation problem. So they have to pretend that it's not a problem, but also pretend that if it ever becomes a problem, they'll do something about it when in fact it's already obviously a problem and they're doing nothing about it, which is an even bigger problem. And again, when the markets figure this out, they will be buying gold. In fact, I think these expectation numbers were actually part of the reason that gold didn't recover from the sell-off related to retail sales. Because as soon as the traders saw this record high in expectations, that trumped the fact that consumer sentiment missed expectations. Because normally, a weak consumer sentiment number would cause traders to buy gold. Because they would think, aha, the consumer is less optimistic, that means the Fed is going to have to provide more stimulus to help the economy, which would be good for gold. But I think people focused on the inflation print as being something that may force the Fed's hand with respect to doing something about rising inflation. Again, it hasn't sunk in yet that the Fed's not going to do anything about inflation because if it could do something about inflation, it already would have done something about inflation. The fact that it keeps making excuses as inflation gets worse should provide proof that they're not going to do anything. So what the market should be focusing on when it comes to gold is that inflation is getting worse. And the more inflation there is, the more reasons there are to hedge and the best hedge against inflation, despite what everybody is saying, is gold. Now, gold isn't the only hedge and it maybe isn't even the best long-term hedge because if you buy productive assets, companies that are producing profits and paying dividends over long periods of time, you can actually do better doing that. But certainly over short periods of time where markets are moving from low inflation to high inflation and people are looking to get out of paper into something real, gold is the goal to asset to own if you want to preserve liquidity, but you want to get out of paper And you don't want to have the added risks associated with owning companies because companies have their own set of risks parameters, which may weigh on their share prices. If you're trying to flee all sorts of risks and you really want to save haven, there's nothing that shines as bright as gold. Despite the fact that its luster may be temporarily dimmed because it's being overshadowed by the speculative mania, in in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies.
And in fact, now that I've gotten to the subject of Bitcoin, I might as well talk about Bitcoin's rise above 60,000. In fact, I think it almost hit 63,000 on Friday. Now, I'm recording this podcast on Saturday morning. And as I'm speaking, Bitcoin is around 61,000. So still comfortably above the 60,000 marker. Although I don't believe it's going to stay above 60,000 for long. The catalyst that has moved Bitcoin up this time is the launching of a Bitcoin futures ETF. And I think that ETF is supposed to debut one day next week. And this is, again, another one of those highly anticipated events that is supposed to be very bullish for Bitcoin. And like most of these highly anticipated events, I expect a buy the rumor, sell the fact. I think they are pumping up the price of Bitcoin. Everybody is getting excited about this ETF. And as soon as this ETF is launched, expect the price of Bitcoin to fall. In fact, more and more people now may be catching on to this pump and dump, buy the rumor, sell the fact. So it's possible that the rally will have already petered out and we may in fact get the dump even before we get the launching of this Bitcoin futures ETF. But I want to talk about this concept of an ETF of Bitcoin futures, because this is not a true Bitcoin ETF where the ETF is going to buy actual Bitcoin. It's simply going to own futures contracts. And the futures contracts, again, are not actual Bitcoin either. They're people who are betting on the future price of Bitcoin, and they're doing it through a futures contract. So this is going to be an ETF that simply owns the futures contract. So in reality, it's a double derivative, right? You have counterparties twice. You have the counterparty risk associated with the futures contract, and now you have the added risk of the ETF, and you have to trust two levels of third parties. And to me, this whole thing contradicts the original Bitcoin narrative that there were no counterparties, there was no custodian, there was no futures contract or derivatives. One of the earlier knocks on gold, and this was one of the things that the Bitcoin proponents were saying was a flaw in gold that Bitcoin didn't have. They said, gold, you have futures markets, and those future markets are where a lot of manipulation takes place. And so the people selling futures contracts are helping to suppress the price of gold. And the good thing about Bitcoin is that there are no futures contracts. So the absence of futures contracts was originally seen as a plus for Bitcoin. Why Bitcoin was better than gold, because it wasn't weighed down by futures contracts. Now, all of a sudden, futures contracts are great for Bitcoin. People are saying, hey, buy Bitcoin because now there's a futures market that legitimizes it. It makes it more mainstream. It creates more demand. So now futures are good for Bitcoin because they have them. But when they didn't have them, well, they were also good for Bitcoin. Because remember, if you're a Bitcoin proponent, all news is bullish for Bitcoin, no matter how bad that news might be. And another aspect of the original Bitcoin story was that there were no custody fees. There were no third parties. Gold was expensive to store. People were buying these gold ETFs and they were having to pay these fees. Just buy Bitcoin. You don't have to pay any fees. You buy it, you store it yourself. Well, when you have an ETF, you're paying fees. Look at the Grayscale Trust, which is not an ETF, but the storage fees are 2% a year. That dwarfs the fees on storing gold. It's about 10 times what you pay for storing gold. But there are a lot of fees associated with futures markets. There's going to be even more fees associated with an ETF of futures contracts. But now when you buy that ETF, you're trusting counterparties. You're trusting third parties. So it's the antithesis of the original Bitcoin story and what supposedly gave the asset its appeal. So I think it's very ironic that now all the Bitcoiners are celebrating the fact that there's going to be an ETF of Bitcoin futures contracts. They should be saying, hey, this undermines the entire purpose of Bitcoin. You shouldn't be buying Bitcoin futures. You shouldn't be buying these ETFs. You should just be buying Bitcoin itself. But apparently 
The reason that so many people or institutions don't want to buy Bitcoin itself is because it's too cumbersome. It's too risky. It's not safe enough. And so instead, they're buying all these derivative instruments to bet on the future price of Bitcoin. But the fact that they don't want to buy Bitcoin itself indicates its lack of real value and appeal and that the only reason people are buying it now is because it's going up and the only reason it's going up is because people are buying it because they think it will keep going up. So it is a massive Ponzi, a massive pyramid that will end badly for all those that are left holding the bag. In fact, looking at the coin market cap now, we're getting close to 13,000 cryptocurrencies. Imagine that. 13,000. Now, the total market cap of these cryptocurrencies is two and a half trillion dollars. So the market cap is growing, but it's being shared by an ever increasing supply of cryptocurrencies. And you know, it's not just the cryptocurrencies, it's also the NFTs, because NFTs are viewed as an alternative way to store your wealth as stores of value, right? People are buying these NFTs because they think they represent a store of value or they're going to appreciate the same way they think that individual cryptocurrencies are going to appreciate. So I think you have to look at it all as crypto assets or crypto property. And so it's not just the 13,000 cryptocurrencies that make up the supply. It's all of the individual NFTs added up. That is all the supply of these crypto assets that you have to use to weigh against the demand to try to figure out what the price is going to be. Because there's no real value in any of these digital assets. It's all a function of supply and demand. And we know that the supply is booming for these assets. And the market can absorb the supply as long as the demand is there. But again, the only reason there's demand for any of this, either cryptocurrencies or NFTs is the perception that they're going to keep appreciating in value. But once that perception changes, the demand collapses. But the problem is the supply has already exploded on the anticipation that that speculative demand will always be there. But once that speculative demand goes away, it's all that additional supply that's really going to come back to bite the market. And you know, when you hear guys like Michael Saylor talk about crypto assets, crypto digital property. And I'm not making this stuff up, right? So you can go on the internet and you can actually hear or see Michael Saylor saying this nonsense. I guess people would think that there's no way anybody could say something like that. No, that's exactly what he says. So he claims that Bitcoin is the best form of digital property. And the reason he says it's the most valuable, it's the best digital property is because it has no maintenance costs. Unlike other property where you have to spend money to maintain it, the beauty of Bitcoin is that you don't have to spend anything to maintain it. Now, the entire Bitcoin network, it's expensive to maintain to the extent that people are transferring their ownership. But for the individual owner, if I just take my Bitcoin and store it on a hard drive or cold storage, I just have my own coin. It doesn't cost me personally anything to maintain that, right? I can keep my Bitcoin on my flash drive for 10 years. And as long as I don't lose it, right, it didn't cost me anything other than I already own the flash drive, right? It didn't really cost me anything to maintain it. So according to Michael Saylor, this low maintenance cost means that digital property is the best property to own. Now, of course, the reason that you don't have high maintenance costs for Bitcoin is that you really have nothing to maintain. I mean, what is Bitcoin? It's just nothing. It's just numbers in, in cyberspace. And when Michael Saylor talks about the beauty of the low cost of Bitcoin, he always talks about other assets. He talks about real estate. He talks about boats. He talks about cars, airplanes, right? Other types of property that people can own. And he talks about how expensive it is to maintain, right? A boat, if you own a boat, it costs a ton of money. You got to find a dock for the boat, right? The boat breaks down. You have to repair it, right? Upkeep, you need gas for it, right? There's all kinds of costs. Ask any boat owner how expensive it is to have a boat, right? The old joke is what are the two happiest days of a boat owner's life? The day he buys it and the day he sells it. And as a bone owner myself, I've owned several boats. I understand that perspective. But 
what Michael Saylor is overlooking when he compares owning Bitcoin to owning a boat is because when you own a boat, you actually have property that you use and enjoy. People buy boats because they want to go boating. They want to be out on the ocean. They want to experience nature, the water. They want to go fishing. They want to go water skiing. They want to just transport. They want to go someplace. They want to go to an island. You know, they, they want to do something. They want to have fun. I mean, if boats weren't fun, if boats weren't enjoyable, people wouldn't be willing to spend all this money to maintain them. The same thing with all these other assets. Yes, property is expensive to maintain because we like living in houses. People enjoy it. It's a place to raise our families. And yes, it costs money to maintain. You got to pay property taxes. There are all these negatives when you own certain types of property, but they are more than offset by all the benefits of owning the property, the joy and the pride that comes along with owning property and getting the exclusive use of that property. Bitcoin doesn't have any of that, right? You don't do anything with your Bitcoin. So the fact that it doesn't cost you anything to maintain it is irrelevant if you don't get any benefit from owning it. If I own a car, I have the benefit of transportation. I can get to work. I can get to the store. I can drive to take a vacation. I need the car for transportation. The maintenance cost is a trade-off that I'm willing to make for the benefits of owning a car and what that allows me to do, the extra freedom that owning my own form of transportation provides. You don't get any of that when it comes to Bitcoin. So you can't simply look at the one side and say, hey, there's no downside to Bitcoin. There's no cost of ownership when there's also no benefit associated with ownership. There's nothing that you gain. There's nothing you can do when you own Bitcoin that you can't do by not owning it. Now, I know you say, well, I can I can give it to somebody else. Yes, I know that. You can give it to somebody else or sell it to somebody else who's also dumb enough not to understand that it has no value and is buying it simply because he's confident another fool is going to be even dumber than he is. That is the dynamic that's going on. But when you listen to a guy like Michael Saylor extol the virtues of digital property and how it's so much better than real property while ignoring all the actual benefits that the owners of real property derive from that property, and not pointing out that none of those benefits accrue to the owners of digital property. You know, also, when I mentioned the fact that there are 13,000 cryptocurrencies, there's only 180 actual currencies, right? So if you're talking about the supply, 180 real fiat currencies versus almost 13,000 cryptocurrencies. Now, I know a lot of people are gonna say, yeah, but you know, central banks could make an unlimited number of each fiat currency, which is true, right? They can keep printing them, but the market can create an unlimited number of cryptocurrencies. And you can't simply say, well, they're not gonna create another Bitcoin. No, they won't create another one that's named Bitcoin. It could have Bitcoin as part of the name, but the name is meaningless. You have to look at the substance. There's very little difference between Bitcoin and a lot of other cryptocurrencies that are virtually identical and in fact in many ways superior to Bitcoin. In fact, a lot of the people that own Bitcoin will admit that it's not the greatest crypto. There are a lot of other cryptocurrencies that do what Bitcoin does even better, but they simply believe that Bitcoin will maintain its value despite its inferiority simply because it was first, which is complete nonsense. Being first doesn't mean you're the best. And just because something is first doesn't mean that everybody is going to want it. And it's not like they're really scarce. It's not like it's some kind of collector item. There are 21 million Bitcoin and you don't have to own an entire Bitcoin to own it. You can own one Satoshi and still claim that you own it. And so anything that can be divisible into that many parts is not going to be a collector's item because anybody in the world who wants to own a Satoshi can buy one. Now, I know a lot of people too are going to say, well, you know, Gold competes with other metals, right? True, but first of all, how many metals are there? I mean, there's, I don't know, 90, 95, something like that, metals on the periodic table. So there are fewer metals than there are fiat currencies, but of course, there are real physical differences between the metals. Gold possesses certain properties 
that other metals don't. So it's not a situation where you can always just substitute a different metal for gold. I mean, sometimes you can, but in many circumstances you can't, which is why gold is used, right? Gold is very expensive. So to the extent that gold is used in certain applications in certain industries, rather than less expensive metals, is because even though gold is more expensive, it's worth the price. And so paying more for the properties that gold has that other metals lack is worth it. You don't have those type of real physical differences among the cryptocurrencies. It's more a function of perception. So the idea that we don't have to worry about additional cryptocurrencies because gold is not the only metal is another nonsense argument that has to be made to try to sustain the irrationality of this crypto bubble. Getting back though to the economic data, there was one more piece of data that I think was relevant that came out on Friday, and that was the Empire State Manufacturing Index. And again, this number was well below estimates and sharply below the level from the prior month, indicating a pretty substantial slowdown. We were at 34.3 on that index in September. The consensus was for a decline to 25. Instead, we climbed all the way to 19.8. That was actually below the lowest estimate in the range of consensus. So again, manufacturing going down, but spending going up, we're producing less, spending more. How do we bridge that gap? Imports, even more imports to clog an already overclogged system, meaning even bigger trade deficits, even more money printing to finance them, and even higher prices. So to me, all of the data, or most of the data anyway, that's coming out would support the stagflation narrative and should be fueling gold's rise. So I think the Friday sell-off really makes no sense other than just a little bit of profit-taking following a strong week and the fact that we still have so much residual skepticism of the market. But to me, I think it looks like we've built a spectacular base here in gold and particularly in these gold mining stocks. And it really is an opportunity for people to invest I don't know how much longer this window is going to be open to get in at such ridiculously low prices, but before it shuts, you should get in. Again, I manage with Adrian Day, the Euro-Pacific Gold Fund. I think that's the best way for most people to get exposure to the gold mining stocks. If you have a larger amount of money, we also offer individually managed precious metals accounts or gold stock accounts, so you can set up an account with us and own the individual stocks directly and will manage the portfolio for you. Or you can simply buy the Euro Pacific Gold Fund and we manage the Gold Fund the same way we manage these separately managed accounts. You can buy the Gold Fund at any of the discount brokerage firms that are out there, or you can set up an account directly with Euro Pacific Capital, or you can go to the Euro Pacific website, epacfunds.com, and you can just buy the funds directly from the Euro Pacific Funds website. I want to talk a little bit, though, about Facebook. Facebook has been in the news. The stock price has come under a lot of pressure. It is well off its 52-week high of $384 in change. We're at $324. So that's about a 15% decline, not quite the 20% that would constitute a bear market, but certainly in correction territory, which Wall Street defines as a decline of 10% or more. And a lot of this is happening from the backlash. There was a whistleblower, I guess it came out and accused Facebook of putting profits before people. Imagine that, a public company, right, prioritizing its own profits, right, over the public good. Now, Mark Zuckerberg was very quick to deny that allegation. No, 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 he said, we don't do that. We don't put profits above people. Well, first of all, really? I mean, you're a for-profit company. Are you telling your investors that you're willing to sacrifice the profitability of your company because of what other people perceive as what's good for the public? I mean, there's nothing wrong with a public company admitting that they prioritize profits because after all, That's what they're supposed to do. But I've never liked this idea, this accusation that capitalism is bad, that companies are bad because they put profits before people. 
because they actually don't. Because if you are a profit maximizing company, you put your customers first, right? The customer is always right. That's an old American saying in business. Even if the customer is wrong, he's right because that's your bread and butter. Businesses are there to serve their customers, to give their customers the best value for their money. They're there to come up with products that customers want to buy at prices that they can afford. And they're always trying to improve the quality and diminish the price. So customers, they're people. So if a business is putting its customers first, it's putting people first because people are customers. Also the shareholders, they're people too. What's wrong with putting their needs, prioritizing their needs? But again, the shareholders needs are always secondary to the customer's needs because if the shareholders want to make the most money, they have to figure out how to best serve the customers. So the customer's needs actually are in front of the shareholder's needs, but only because serving the customers serves the shareholders. Everybody, when they want to talk about companies putting profits before people, all they focus on is their employees or maybe some other stakeholders, like, oh, they fired somebody because it improved their profitability, right? Therefore, they're putting profits over people. But if a company is reducing its staff in order to improve its profits, it's probably being driven to do so through competitive pressures. It is probably trying to maintain the competitiveness of its goods and services, so it can continue to deliver value to its customers. So what the company is doing is putting its customers' needs ahead of its employees' needs. Now, you can't say that that's putting profits over people unless you want to ignore the fact that customers are also people. And of course, if you think about the employee who may lose his job because his employer was trying to benefit his customers, and so in order to do that, his particular job was eliminated, that employee is also a customer of other businesses. So the fact that his employer may not be putting his needs first, there's all these other businesses that he is buying goods and services from on maybe a daily basis. All of those other businesses are putting his needs first as a consumer. And if we take a step back and we realize that all workers are also consumers, they all benefit from businessmen putting the consumer's interest first because we all benefit as consumers. So I've never liked this socialist Marxist allegation that greedy businesses prioritize profits over people. We always want to point out as entrepreneurs and business owners, why this is nonsense, which is why I was disappointed in Zuckerberg's response. I would have loved him to explain why putting profits first is putting people first and why every American consumer benefits from the fact that businesses are prioritizing their needs above all else. But I want to finish up today's podcast by focusing on the most ridiculous news story I read all week. And this one has to do with the Art Institute of Chicago, one of the most prestigious, one of the largest art museums in the country. And the Art Institute of Chicago was in the news because they fired all of their docents. And the docents are people who volunteer their services to the art museum. So they're, they're unpaid volunteers. And there was 122 of them. And what they did is they basically acted as tour guides at the museums. And so they led these tours. They were there at the museums to direct people, to answer their questions, and to really improve the experience and the educational benefits of all of the people who were going to the art museum. And there was a lot of work involved, not just the actual work of being in the museum and leading the tours, but there was lots of educational requirements that the museum had for all the people who wanted to volunteer to be docent. Before they could even be a docent, they had to have two training sessions a week for 18 months, again, unpaid, and then they needed five years of continual research 
and writings to meet the criteria to volunteer. So it was very difficult to even qualify to volunteer to be a docent. So then why did people want to do it? Well, people really loved art and there was a sense of pride in being at the museum and people who love the art obviously love explaining art to other people. They want to see their passion for art live on in future generations and they really enjoy helping young people appreciate and understand art and they are imparting their wisdom. And because of the qualifications and how much time is required, the vast majority of these docents were older people. Most of them happen to be women. They're older, retired women, and most of them happen to be white, right? That's just the reality. So you have a lot of older white women who had a lot of free time on their hands and who loved art and were willing to volunteer. Now, you know, why so many women? Well, maybe men would rather be out playing golf in their retirement. They weren't as excited about the prospect of spending all that time in a museum, whatever. Women wanted to do it. Why were so many of them white? Well, maybe more white women just happen to have the resources where they can devote all this free time to being docents. For whatever reasons, you just had a lot of older white women. But apparently, the Art Institute of Chicago had problems with old white women. They didn't like them because it wasn't diverse enough. Now, apparently, they were trying to get some people of color. Maybe they were trying to get men or it was just they wanted African-Americans. I'm not really sure how much diversity they really wanted, but they claimed they needed diversity, but they failed. They couldn't convince enough African-Americans to volunteer their services and work for free at the Art Institute, right? Who cares? So what? They didn't want to volunteer. Well, apparently this was a big deal. And so the Art Institute fired to the extent that you can fire a volunteer, right? But they got rid of all of these volunteers, highly skilled, highly trained people that were offering the value of their knowledge and their insight and their passion for free to all the people who were paying to go to this museum. They got rid of all those guys and instead they hired people to do the job instead. And because they're paying them, they didn't have a budget to get 122. So the article said they have a much smaller staff now and they're paying people $25 an hour to do the work that other people were doing for free. But apparently it's better because it's more diverse. So apparently they were able to find African-Americans who would do the work for $25 an hour. They wouldn't do it for free, but if you pay them $25 an hour, they're willing to do it. Now, it didn't really mention anything about the quality but I'm sure the quality is way down because I'm sure a lot of people are now not doing the job because they love art and because they know a lot about art. It's because they want 25 bucks and it's an easy way to make the money, right? You just stand around a museum. I mean, I'm not even sure to the degree that they're having tours, how many tours they're gonna have. And if these tour guides even know much about art because they rushed and they hired them, I'm sure they don't have anywhere near the training. They certainly don't have the life experience and they're doing it again because they want to get paid. They're not enjoying the job. They're probably looking at their watch all day or the clocks on the wall waiting for quitting time so they can go home. So the bottom line is the museum had a bunch of highly skilled, dedicated white women who were doing the work for free. They got rid of them all. And now they have a diverse group of people who they're paying $25 an hour. But who really suffers? I mean, Forget about the fact that these docents can no longer be involved in the museum and they obviously derive benefit that was not monetary. They enjoyed being a part of the museum and so they're now being denied that opportunity. But the people who go to the museum are now being denied the experience of having their tours led by knowledgeable people who can answer their questions. The tours are gonna be less frequent Maybe they're even going to have to raise the price of the tours. I don't know if they charge for the tours. I know they charge for admission. If you go on the website, it's not cheap to go to the art museum. 
It's $25 for an adult admission. If you happen to be a Chicago resident, it's a little cheaper. It's $20. Even students pay $19. Kids 14 to 17 is 19. It's only under 14 where you're free. Now, maybe they're going to have to raise the prices because now they're paying these docents, whereas before they were working for free. I mean, there is no free lunch. But more importantly is the quality is going to go down. But why did they need to do this? I mean, apparently, according to the museum and the people that support it, the people who were visiting the museum, maybe the African-Americans, somehow felt that their experience was somehow diminished because their tours were being conducted by older white women. And somehow it would have been better, they would have felt better about the tour if there were black people that were leading the tours, that somehow the museum goers need to be able to racially identify with the people who are doing the tours, which is a bunch of nonsense. Who gives a damn about the race or the gender of your tour guide? What is important is how good the tour is, how knowledgeable the tour guide is, and the way they impart that knowledge, the way they present it, and their ability to answer your questions. Who cares about their race or their gender? And imagine if this story was reversed. I mean, what if you had a public company somewhere in the country and they fired all of their black employees and they replaced them with white employees? And the reason was they wanted more diversity. They just had too many black people and they thought their white customers would not be comfortable with all these black people. And so they wanted to make sure there was enough white people there so that their white customers would feel comfortable. I mean, could you imagine the backlash, the outrage? I mean, imagine white people are so racist that they want to only deal with other white people. Well, that's exactly what they're saying about the blacks who are going to the museum, that these racist black people just are upset that they have a bunch of white women leading the tours. And so we got to get rid of these white women so our black customers will feel comfortable with black tour guides. Now, I don't think there's any truth to that at all. I don't think any of the black people who were going to the museum, I don't think any of them cared that the people who were conducting the tours were white people or white women. Do you think the men were upset? Hey, you know, there's not enough men. I don't want female tour guides. I I need some men. Nobody cared. This is all about this museum, form over substance, trying to put diversity above everything else. I mean, diversity can have its benefits in certain circumstances, but it's not the be all and end all. I mean, it's not about being diverse. I mean, what if you had to go to a hospital and You know, you asked about the medical staff and the response you got was, well, yeah, we've got the most diverse staff in the city. You know, we have doctors and nurses of all genders, all races, all sexual orientation. Who gives a crap about that, right? Is that the hospital you want to go to that has the most diverse staff? Or do you want to go to the hospital and say, we've got the best doctors. We've got the best nurses. We only hire the best. We have the greatest doctors in the city. That's where you want to go. Who gives a damn about the ethnic diversity, and it doesn't matter what race you are, right? If you're a black guy and you go to the hospital, you want the best doctor, not the blackest doctor. It doesn't matter. And certainly you never hear this type of criticism in other areas, lack of diversity. Does anybody ever complain about the lack of diversity in the NBA? There's no diversity in the NBA at all. It's just a bunch of tall, young black men. I mean, yes, I mean, there's some white guys there, but basically tall, young, black men. Is that a problem for anybody? No. I mean, are they saying we need diversity? I mean, who wants to watch a bunch of short, old white women play basketball? Nobody, right? People want to watch the best basketball. And if the best basketball is delivered by young, tall, black men, well, then that's the composition of the NBA. You think the white basketball players that are buying these tickets? Do you think they have a problem with the fact that there's not enough white guys? If they did, they wouldn't be buying tickets, but they're buying tickets because they don't care. They want to see the best basketball teams play, not the most diverse basketball teams play. And of course, nobody complains about it. But if it's fine that the basketball teams be a bunch of young black men, why can't the docents 
in a Chicago museum be a bunch of old white women. What is the difference? And again, this is not about discrimination. Nobody is saying that black applicants who wanted to be docents were denied the opportunity because they were black. They weren't. The museum actually went out of its way searching for blacks to volunteer and none of them wanted to. So they had the opportunity. They just didn't want to take advantage of it. So what's the problem? Why does the museum have to address a wrong that never even occurred? And again, it's not like blacks are being denied paying positions, right? They needed a job and now they can't earn this money because they were black. The docents are paid nothing. They were denied the opportunity to work for free. I mean, most people don't want to work for free. The fact that they find anybody at all willing to devote all this work and do it for free, we should be celebrating the fact that people are willing to do it. And what we need to do is honor the wisdom of older Americans their experience and the fact that they are retired and that now they are in a position to really give something back and that younger people can benefit from the wisdom and the experience of older people. We should be rejoicing in that. We should be cherishing that we even have that resource. But instead, all of that has to be sacrificed on the altar of political correctness so we can simply hire a bunch of people who we claim are racially diverse to do a job that they're probably not even qualified to do, to diminish the experience of everybody who goes to the art museum, including the African-Americans who are going there. So now African-American students who probably make up a pretty large percentage of the student-going population in a Chicago museum, now these African-American students who are going to the art museum are not going to get anywhere near as much benefit from the experience. They're not going to learn anywhere near as much as they would have learned had those older white women been on the job. Are they really better off? Because now there's black tour guides who maybe don't even want to be there, couldn't give a damn, or just there to collect a $25 check and don't have anywhere near the knowledge of art as the people they replaced. Are the customers really benefiting? Of course not. And again, I talked about businesses putting their customers first. Here is a situation where the customers are last, right? The art museum doesn't give a damn about the quality of the experience of their customers because if they cared, they would have left the docents alone. It's only because they don't care and because they're actually placing political correctness above the interest of their own customers, including their African-American customers. You know, there are a lot of real problems that the people in Chicago should be concerned with. The docents in the art museum being too white is not one of them. I mean, look at the crime that's taking place in Chicago. You know, the murder rate is now the highest it's been since 1996. Worry about that. A lot of African-Americans getting murdered in Chicago. What about the city's credit rating? You know, Moody's rates their municipal bonds as junk. So instead of worrying about how to get the staff at the museum to be diversified, how about getting the city's fiscal house in order? That's much more relevant and far more important to the African-Americans who live in Chicago than the diversity of the docents at the Museum of Art. And I think this is a much bigger problem that goes far beyond just this museum because I think this type of thinking is going to spread and I think it will continue to undermine the productive capacity of the U.S. economy to the detriment of all people, including African Americans and other minorities that are supposedly the beneficiaries of this asinine policy. 